بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن صار على نهجه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him, we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides there is none and nothing that can misguide him and whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides there is none that can guide him and I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and with no partner and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and final messenger hoping for the Baraka of following the guidance of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in everything that we do and in this specific gathering that we have today I will begin by reciting the ayat that it was the custom of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he would recite when he would begin a matter of importance such as a speech or a khutbah he would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would begin by reciting the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, Ayyuhaladina Amanu Takullah Haqqa Tukatih, Wala Tamutunna illa wa antum Muslimun. O you who believe, fear Allah as he deserves to be feared and do not die except as Muslims. And then he would recite, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, Ittaku Rabbakum Ladi Khalaka Kum in Nafsin Wahida. وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا O mankind, fear your Lord who created you from a single soul and created from it its mate and created from them both many men and women and fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights. Indeed, Allah is ever watchful over you. And he would finish sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by reciting another ayah, which is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha wa koolu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuti'i allaha wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azima. O you who believe, fear Allah and speak a word that is true. He will correct your deeds and forgive you your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has indeed achieved a great success. And it was narrated by Al-Imam and Nasai and others rahimahullah ta'ala that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Amma ba'd, inna asdaq al-hadithi kitabullah wa ahsan al-huda, huda Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْتَثَاتُهَا وَكُلَّ مُحْتَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ He would say that indeed the most truthful of speech is the book of Allah and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of matters in this religion are those newly invented matters that have no basis in the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of these matters are innovations and every single kind of innovation is misguidance and every misguidance is in the hellfire. The brother kindly, Jazahullahu Khairan, has already introduced me and I thought I would just expand on that just a little bit since this is the first time that I've come to Green Lane to deliver a lecture. I accepted Islam at the age of 14 years old. Um, after that, I went through a period where I was pretty lost. I was looking for some help and looking for some instruction and some brothers in Newcastle where I'm from, they were able to, you know, by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come and help me and to show me the right way. After which I applied for the Islamic University of Medina and as the brother mentioned, I graduated from the faculty of Hadith at the beginning of this year. Today I work with an organization called IDC Northeast which is an organization based in the northeast of England, in Newcastle, Middlesbrough, and some other places, which is dedicated to challenging stereotypes and removing misconceptions around Islam, working with non-Muslims and supporting new Muslims, and as well doing classes and lectures for our Muslim brothers and sisters as well. I thought since this is the first lecture in the series, 
that I would talk just a little bit to begin with about diseases of the heart. And I only want to take two or three minutes of your time, inshallah, just to talk a little bit about diseases of the heart. And you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, I really, really liked the way that the, the, the topic is worded, that the brothers have worded this particular topic. Because it really is, as much as it is a disease of the heart, it really is an infection in the sense that it tends to spread. And the more we encourage these diseases in the heart, the more they spread. And so in that way, it is rather like an infection. And the term disinfecting the heart is a, a very appropriate term for this topic. I thought I would begin by reminding us all, and I'm sure this is a hadith we have heard several times before, from Abu Abdullah and Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu an, Huma, who said that I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Truly what is lawful is clear and evident. And what is haram is clear and evident. And in between the two are these matters which are doubtful. The grey areas which many people do not know about. Whoever guards against these doubtful things keeps his religion and his honour blameless. And whoever indulges in these grey areas, in these doubtful things, in fact he is indulging in the unlawful, in the haram. Just like a shepherd who grazes his flock along the edge of a preserve. Soon one of them will step over into it. Meaning that if you continue to involve yourself in these grey matters and in these difficult issues that not very many people know, whether it's halal or whether it's haram, eventually you run the risk of stepping over into the haram. Just like if you were to graze your sheep along the edge of a pasture or the edge of a field. How long will it be before one of your sheep steps over onto the other side? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued and he said, Beware that every king has his own private preserve. And the things which Allah has declared unlawful are his own private preserve. Beware that in the body there is a piece of flesh. If it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. And indeed it is the heart. And this is a very nice introduction to the topic of diseases of the heart. And it shows us just how important this topic is. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described the entire success and the entire soundness of the whole body as being relating to the soundness or the corruption of the heart. And we as Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jama'ah and Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah talked about this a great deal. About this belief that we have about this link between our inner faith and our outer actions. We are not like those people from Ahlul Bid'ah who distinguished completely between the two and separated but completely between the two. As people of Ahlul Sunnah, we don't believe that it's possible for a person to have a completely corrupt and diseased and infected heart and to have completely pious and wonderful and sound action. Because there is a talazum, there is a, a, a link or a, a bond between the inner heart and between the outer actions. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described this and Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah he goes on to quote this hadith that the, in the body there is a piece of flesh. If that piece of flesh is sound, the whole body is sound. And if that piece of flesh is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. And so a massive amount of our outward purity and our actions being accepted by Allah and our prayers being accepted by Allah and our fasting being accepted by Allah, a huge amount of this comes down to the purity of our hearts. And so when we talk about diseases of the heart, we're talking about something very, very, very important. Also, the topic of diseases of the heart is a difficult topic. And it's difficult for the individual because the sins of the heart and the sins that you can commit relating to the actions of the heart are a lot more complex than many of the sins that we commit with our limbs. It's very easy to tell when you are doing something haram with your limbs. It's quite easy to tell when you go somewhere haram, when you do something haram, when you look at something haram. You recognize this. And it's quite easy for you to understand that you've done it. And inshallah, for those who Allah gives tawfiq, it's quite easy to make tawbah from. But there are many, many, many people and many of us who we have diseases of our heart that we are not even aware of. And the sins of the heart are very, 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 very difficult. They're very complex and they're very well hidden. And this is why things like renewing our intention are so difficult to do. This is why somebody might turn around and say, 
today I didn't commit a sin. Because they are looking purely at their outward actions. They're saying today I didn't go anywhere haram and I didn't backbite anybody and I didn't, you know, I didn't look at anything haram inshallah and so the shaitan tricks them into believing that they didn't commit a sin. But some of the ulama, they mentioned that a huge part of the sins that we commit relate to the sins that rest from the actions of the heart, that come from the actions of the heart, that rest in the heart. And those sins are much harder to spot. And that's why one, when we talk about the cures for some of the diseases of the heart and the cures of pride, some of the ulama mentioned from that best of these cures is to seek knowledge. And so we hope that inshallah today will be a beneficial exercise for all of us, myself and all of you to come together and to remind us about some of these diseases of the heart and pride in particular. And then to look at how we can recognize it and how we can come to cure it and inshallah how we can come to make tawbah from it. So that we don't be from those people who we can see that we have made a big effort to purify our outward actions. We said, you know, I used to smoke and I've quit smoking. I used to do such and such and I've quit doing it. I used to be involved in such and such and I've stopped doing it. But how many of us spend the time to look at our, our hearts and to look at whether or not we have the proper trust in Allah and the proper fear of Allah and whether or not we are free from some of these diseases of the hearts which I'm going to talk about today and which inshallah ta'ala the other speakers will talk about in the coming weeks. The first thing I thought we would do is to look at some of the ayat in the Quran that relate to pride. And I have a particular, I guess, a bee in my bonnet a little bit about our implementation of the Qur'an when we hear it. A lot of us hear a lot of the Qur'an recited, a lot of us listen to it in the car, a lot of us attend a lot of lectures of khutbahs and so on and so forth where the khatib or the speaker is reciting ayat from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But many, many, many times these ayat go in one ear and out of the other. And so what I wanted to do today is something which I'm told is perhaps a little bit different to what you're used to, but it's something I do quite a lot in my speeches and lectures, is that I want to get all of you involved in this little part of the lecture. I'm going to recite for you some ayat of the Qur'an that relate to pride. And I'm going to read you, inshallah ta'ala, an approximate translation of these ayat. And then I'm going to ask you to tell me some benefits that you understand from this. So that we don't be from those people who we hear the Qur'an recited, but the Qur'an doesn't enter into our hearts. It just goes in one ear and out of the other. And this is a real, real problem. A lot of us read a lot of the Qur'an, mashallah, tabarakallah. Or some brothers, they read a juz, or they read five juz, or they read ten juz, or so on and so forth, every single day. But subhanAllah, it's not just about reading, but it's about understanding. And you know, it doesn't have to be that we all have to be these you know, huge mufassireen of the Qur'an, these translators and these interpreters of the Qur'an, it can be enough that we just ask ourselves, what did you benefit from this? And also there's a, you know, a secondary goal in this, which is that often a teacher benefits from the students just as much or even more than the students benefit from the teacher. So I'm hoping ta'ala, that you'll be able to give me some very, very good points around these ayat, and then I'll tell you what my reflections are on these ayat. I've mixed them up a little bit to give you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a chance to really rethink really rather than it being in a structured uh, order as such. The first ayah that I wanted us to reflect upon collectively is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal wa qala Musa inni uzzu bi rabbi wa rabbikum min kulli mutakabbirin la yu'minu bi yawm al-hisab. Musa alayhi salam said, Indeed, I have sought refuge in my Lord and your Lord from every arrogant one who does not believe in the day of account. And here particularly, I want to focus on every arrogant one. So Musa alayhi salam, he says, as Allah azza mentions to us in the Quran, that I seek refuge from every arrogant, every one full of pride that does not believe in yawm al-hisab, that does not believe in the day of account. So I want one of the brothers, inshallah ta'ala, to tell me what you benefit from this. Give me a point of benefit from this as it relates to the topic of arrogance and pride. Somebody be brave, otherwise I'll start picking on people. Yeah? Doesn't matter, share a benefit with us, inshallah. Be brave. I can't believe that everybody in this room listens to this ayah and nobody understands anything from it. Excellent, very, very good. 
So kufr and disbelief, it has a relationship with, with arrogance, yeah? And it is in itself the worst form of arrogance. And arrogance can lead to kufr and disbelief. What else? What else? Something I particularly found in Musa seeking refuge with his Lord from every arrogant one that does not believe in the day of account. Go on. So in other words, if we rephrase that, we can say that arrogance is something that we should seek refuge from. We should ask Allah to save us from two things. From being people who are arrogant and from being pe people who are affected or oppressed by people who commit arrogance. And kind of as a follow-on point from that, we can say that arrogance leads to oppression. Otherwise, why would it be that Musa would be seeking refuge from being affected or being harmed by somebody who was arrogant? So there's the link between disbelief and between arrogance and there is the aspect of seeking refuge from, from being arrogant and from being affected by those who are arrogant and the aspect of the fact that arrogance leads to you harming and oppressing other people. And I'm going to use pride and arrogance here interchangeably. Some people, it seems in, in, in particularly in the Sahih International Translation of the Quran, they prefer the word arrogance for kibr. But if we say arrogance or we say pride, inshallah, we're going to talk a little bit about the word pride later on in the English language because I think we have to make a distinction between different types of pride, but that will come later. Next is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. الَّذِينَ يُجَادِلُونَ فِي آيَاتِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ سُلْطَانٍ أَتَاهُمْ كَبُرَ مَقَتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَعِنْدَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كَذَلِكَ يَطُبَعُ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ قَلْبِ مُتَكَبِّرٍ جَبَّارٍ those who dispute concerning the signs of Allah without any authority having come to them. Great hatred of them in the sight of Allah and the sight of those who have believed. Like this, Allah seals every heart belonging to an arrogant tyrant. Particularly focus on, in this way, Allah seals the heart belonging to an arrogant tyrant. What do we benefit from this? When you hear this, how do you apply this to your life? So continuing in arrogance can lead to your heart being, being sealed. And it's one of the reasons why Allah can seal the hearts of the people. Subhanallah. So we need to reflect upon the fact that arrogance and pride is something that is going to lead in the long run to your heart being sealed. And so it really is an infection that spreads right through the heart. And when it reaches all the corners of the heart, the heart is sealed. And then when the heart is sealed, we know that after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not guide that person. Subhanallah. So we need to reflect upon that a little bit. The next one. The statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. I'm going to read just this in English now because we're going to have to speed up a little bit. And mention when they will argue within the fire and the weak will say to those who had been arrogant, indeed we were only of your followers, so will you relieve of us a share of the hellfire? Those who had been arrogant will say, indeed all of us are in it, indeed Allah has judged between his servants. So arrogance is something that's going to lead people into the hellfire and the arrogant people, the people who are consumed by arrogance are going to be from the people of the hellfire. We're going to listen later on, inshallah, to what Ibn Taymiyyah has to say around this particular topic. Rahimahullah. So primarily one of the greatest things we benefit from this ayah is the people who are arrogant are going to be the people of the hellfire. And when you're consumed by pride and arrogance, this is only leading you to one place. It's leading you to the hellfire. Good. The next is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ أَسْتَ إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ In Surah Al-Baqarah. And likewise in Surah Saad, إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ إِسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ That except for Iblis, he was arrogant and he became amongst the disbelievers. So the pride of Iblis and the arrogance of Iblis led him to disbelieve. In our own lives, we can take from this two things. First of all, that by being full of pride and arrogance, we are following the path of Iblis alayhi la'natullah. And secondly, that 
arrogance and pride, like we said before, and like the brother mentioned, can lead you into disbelief, as it led Iblis into disbelief. And it can lead you to the hellfire, as it led Iblis to the hellfire. So this is something very, very serious. It's a very serious illness of the heart. And the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla, and from his signs of the night and the day and the sun and the moon, do not prostrate to the sun or to the moon, but prostrate to Allah who created them, if you really worship him. But if they are arrogant, then those who are near to your Lord, exalt him by night and by day and do not become weary. I deliberately put this ayah after the ayah about Iblis. And I want you to reflect upon that. Who is mentioned in this ayah and what is mentioned regarding arrogance and them? But if they are arrogant, then those who are near to your Lord, exalt him by night and by day and they do not become weary. Arrogance prevents you from knowledge, no doubt about that. There is a famous statement that knowledge will not be achieved by the one who is shy or the one who is arrogant. It's a famous statement of one of the Salaf, that knowledge will not be achieved by the one who is shy or the one who is arrogant. In this particular ayah, I was focusing upon the angels. The angels are mentioned and what characteristic of the angels is mentioned in contrast to the characteristic of Iblis, that the angels are not arrogant. They exalt Allah by night and by day and they do not become weary. And that arrogance is a characteristic of Bani Adam because from this Allah is talking to the creation and specifically to those people who are the Ummah to Da'wah, the Ummah to which the Prophet uh, came to give the message of Islam. And in this, Allah says, but if they are arrogant. And this tells us that arrogance is a quality from the qualities that is unfortunately uh, or unfortunately occurs to some of the children of Adam. You had a point, Akhi, tafadda. Good. That's a very, very good point. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Jayid. Okay, continuing. The eminent ones who are among his people said to those who are oppressed, to those who believed among them, do you know that Saleh has been sent by his Lord? They said, indeed, we are with that which we have sent. Believers, those who are arrogant said, indeed, we are in which you have believed. We are disbelievers. I, we have disbelieved in that thing which you had believed in. This is the people of Salih, a conversation which is happening between those people who are arrogant and between those people who believe. Those who are arrogant say, do you know for sure that Salih is a messenger? And those people who believe, they say, we are certain that he is a messenger from our Lord. And then afterwards, the question goes to those people who are arrogant and they say, we are disbelievers in, what, well, in, in that which you have believed in. It's a particular point I wanted to benefit from this. That these people, and this is mentioned, this might come in another ayah that we're going to mention, that even if the truth comes to these people, if they see, as Allah Azawajal says, if they saw every single ayah, their arrogance prevents them from entering into Islam. And subhanAllah, this shows you the danger of arrogance and pride. That subhanAllah, it is something that can prevent somebody so completely that if they were to see every single ayah, they would not believe. But specifically in here, what I wanted to talk about was how arrogance is a characteristic of all of those people who rejected the message of the messengers. Alayhim as-salatu salam. Shu'aib, it is mentioned about. It is mentioned about Salih. It is mentioned about Nuh. It is mentioned about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is mentioned about nearly, it's certainly mentioned about Musa, if not all of the prophets in the Qur'an. I certainly can't think from the top of my head of any prophet in the Quran that is mentioned, that is not mentioned about his people, that they were arrogant and that that was the reason why they refused to accept the message of this particular prophet. And Allah says, and those who do not expect to meet with us say, why were not angels sent down to us or why do we not see our Lord? They have certainly become arrogant within themselves and have become insolent with the greatest form of insolence. And this shows us that this arrogance 
that like we said that can lead you to reject every single ayah that can lead you to reach the level where you question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you say why has Allah not sent down an angel why has Allah not done this why has Allah not guided me and this statement why me you know this statement that people make why me why why am I not guided why hasn't Allah why has Allah done this to me and why hasn't Allah done this to me this tells us that this is a form of arrogance because a similar statement is mentioned and then Allah says that they have certainly become arrogant. They have certainly become arrogant. So these kind of statements are statements of arrogance. Continuing on, and there are a few more ayat that we want to cover. And we certainly did give Musa the Torah and we followed him up with messengers and we gave Isa son of Mary clear proofs and we saw, supported him with a pure spirit. But is it not that every time a messenger came to you or children of Israel with what your souls did not desire, you were arrogant, a party of messengers you denied and another party you killed. And this shows us that from the characteristics of the children of Israel. And we know the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that we will follow the way of the people who came before you. Hand span by hand span. We know this is a statement from the Prophet ﷺ. And we know from the characteristics of the children of Israel is that they were arrogant and full of pride. We know that Allah has commanded us as Muslims not to have this arrogance and pride. In the ayat that talk about the adab, the characteristics, the mannerisms of a Muslim. When Allah says, and do not walk upon the earth exultantly. You will never tear the earth apart and you will never reach the mountains in height. So Allah is instructing us in these ayat that deal with the adab, the manners and the, the, the khuluq, the akhlaq of a Muslim that a Muslim is not somebody who is full of arrogance and somebody who is full of pride. And we already talked about how Jahannam is the abode of the people who are full of pride. As Allah says, so enter the gates of hell to abide therein eternally and how wretched is the residence of the arrogant. This concludes the little part where I wanted to talk about certain ayat in the Qur'an and this is by no means all of the ayat in the Qur'an on this subject. This is simply just a few ayat that give us a few points of benefit. And when we come to those points of benefit later on and when you listen to some of the statements of the ulama and what they have to say about pride, reflect how that relates to those ayat. And this will lead you to achieving something very, very important. It will lead you to achieving the ability to listen to the ayat of Allah to really reflect upon them and to be able to take a benefit out of them The next thing I wanted to talk about is some of the ahadith that talk about pride in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah The Prophet said No one will enter paradise who has an atom's weight of arrogance in his heart And the Prophet said in a hadith talking about what Jahannam will say, that the hellfire will say, my share is the arrogant. My share of Bani Adam are those arrogant ones. And this relates to what we've talked about in the ayat before. And in another hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that on the day of resurrection, the arrogant will be gathered like ants in the form of men. And it's worth thinking about this, and this is something I want to highlight later on as well, inshaAllah ta'ala. That in general, in Islam, the punishment which somebody receives is generally appropriate or similar to the sin that they commit. As we say in Arabic, al jazaa min jins al-amal. That the punishment that you get or the reward that you get is, a sim is similar or is a part of the action that you did. So those people who have pride and they are arrogant and they are full of arrogance and we're going to hear some of the ahadith about what will happen to them bear in mind that those ahadith the reason why these punishments are given to these people who are arrogant is because these punishments are given as a almost like a sign or like a, an emphasis that those people who are arrogant Allah punishes them by disgracing them in the worst possible way and so in general all of the punishment for pride and arrogance is the worst form of disgrace because this is what is appropriate and suitable and similar to the sin that that person committed. I now wanted to give you some excerpts from Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah's explanation of the hadith about not entering into paradise if you have a mustard seed worth of uh, pride in your heart. 
And the reason I wanted to focus on this is this hadith is slightly, it has some issues in it that we need to discuss. It has some points of aqidah in it that we need to be very aware of. We need to be careful that we don't exclude all of the believers from paradise. And we need to be careful that we don't deny and negate the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal and the sunnah of his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that relates that punishment. So by taking this explanation of Ibn Taymiyyah, the purpose here inshaAllah ta'ala is just to quote you a few pieces of what he said about this hadith uh, to try to give you an understanding about the aqidah related to this particular hadith about pride. Ibn Taymiyyah says that kibr that openly opposes and negates iman results in the banishment of the one who holds it from entering into Jannah. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, call upon me and I will respond to your supplication. Indeed, those who have kibr, those who, have, who scorn my worship, they, have, they are too, have too much pride to worship me, they will surely enter into hell in humiliation. And Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he goes on to say, this is the kibr of Iblis, the kibr of Fir'aun, and all of the others which possess this kibr, which completely invalidated their iman. And this is the kibr that the Jews possess and those whom Allah has described to us by saying, is it that whenever they came to you a messenger with what yourselves desired not, you grew arrogant, some of them you disbelieved in and some of them you killed. So Ibn Taymiyyah here is talking about the kibr that encompasses a person to the point where it seals their heart as we described in the previous ayat. That they can get to a point where kibr can so completely overcome a person that they become so prideful and arrogant and turn away from all of the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal that they become like who? Like Fir'aun, like Iblis, and like the people, the children of Israel who had no iman whatsoever. And so those people for sure will never enter Jannah. They will never enter Jannah uh, no matter how long uh, they reside because they are guilty of disbelief. In other words, their kibr led, to them, led them to a level of disbelief, like Iblis, like Fir'aun, and like the children of Israel. And this is the kibr which is mentioned in the ayat in which Allah Azza wa Jal says uh, that whenever there came to you a messenger with what you did not desire, some of them uh, you grew arrogant, some of them you disbelieved in, and some of them you killed. Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say, he says that kibr in its entirety openly opposes everything essential about Iman. All of the foundations of Iman is wiped out by Kibr. As such, whoever has an atom's weight of Kibr in his heart will not act upon what Allah has prescribed. So he will not pray and he will not do those things that Allah has told him to do. And he will not abstain from those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited him from. His Kibr will result in him rejecting the truth completely and having contempt of others. This is the definition of al-kibr provided by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the hadith that the one who possesses an atom's weight of kibr in his heart will never be granted permission to paradise. Then he sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked. This is continuing the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. O Messenger of Allah, a man likes to have fine clothing and footwear. Is this included in pride? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam responded, No, Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. Kibr is rejection of the truth and being condescending towards others. And Ibn Taymiyyah explained that this means to reject, have disdain, have hatred for the truth and to reject the truth and to have contempt and to look down on other people from amongst mankind. So Ibn Taymiyyah goes on to say that the one who possesses half a mustard seed of this will reject all of the truth that he has been ordered to accept. And this kibr will lead him to have this looking down on people that will make him oppress others and transgress against the rights of others. The one who neglects his obligations and is oppressive to others is not from the people of Jannah while he is in this state, nor does he deserve to be from the people of Jannah. He is from those people who are threatened with punishment. So here Ibn Taymiyyah is talking about a second group of people, not a group of people that are being consumed by kibr completely to the point where they have disbelieved, but a person who has that degree of oppression in his heart. And so what will happen to him? He will be oppressive towards others and he will be ignorant and neglectful of those things that Allah has made obligatory upon him. So what will happen? He is not deserving of Jannah, but he is from those people that if Allah Azza wa Jal wills, he will forgive him. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, he will overlook this, uh, that he will punish him for this sin of his. But he is threatened with punishment. This is why Ibn Taymiyyah uses the word threatened with punishment. 
He is deserving of punishment. And if Allah Azawajal forgives him, he forgives him. And then he continues by saying that the Prophet ﷺ said that anyone who possesses a speck of kibber in his heart will not be granted admission to paradise. This implies that the person is not from the people of Jannah and is not deserving. But if he repents, or if he has some righteous deeds, or if Allah has given him trials and tests in the form of calamities, or, sit, or have, uh, has cleaned his sins or similar, he may have cleaned him from this pride that would stop him from entering into Jannah and likewise the grace and the mercy of Allah may lead to this person being forgiven. So when we talk about kibr, we talk about two groups of people. One group who has encompassed them so much that they have led them to absolute kufr and they have turned away completely from the ayat of Allah like Iblis and like Fir'aun and like others. These people will never enter Jannah. As for the one who is consumed by it but is still within the fold of Islam, this person does not deserve Jannah, but they may have things that happen to them in their life which expiate that particular sin of their pride. And it may be that Allah out of His grace and His mercy forgives them. And this is the same that we say about all of the ahadith that talk about punishment, so-and-so will never enter Jannah, or so-and-so is from the people of the hellfire. If that person is from the Muslims, then they are underneath the Mashiach of Allah If Allah wishes to forgive them, He will forgive them. And if Allah wishes to punish them, He will punish them. And they are deserving and they are threatened with this punishment of Allah. And this punishment will happen. Allah will not overlook every single person. This is also from the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah when it comes to these ahadith that deal with these kinds of issues. That yes, Allah may overlook certain individuals who are guilty of kibr who have not reached the level of disbelief. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the punishment will happen and it will occur because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised it. And so it must happen to at least a group from amongst the Muslims. The next thing I wanted to talk about is briefly uh, Al-Allama Sa'di rahimahullah also talks about this hadith. And in, when, when a Sa'di talks about this hadith, he, he distinguishes two types of pride. He splits pride into two different groups. Pride against the truth, which means to reject the truth and not to accept it. And he says that it's obligatory for everyone to humble themselves to the truth which Allah sent his messenger with sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, as for those whose pride and arrogance prevents them from complying with the messengers, that then they are kuffar the one that has no belief at all. His pride reaches a level where he does not believe in any of the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal or he denies some of the ayat. This person will dwell in hellfire for eternity. Since when the truth comes to them, they are proud, they, are, they, they reject it because of their pride. And he mentions about this, this ayah that we have talked about. Indeed, those who argue about the signs of Allah without any authority having come to them, there is nothing in their hearts except kibr. They will not accept the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a messenger. And then As-Sa'di, rahimahullah, he continues to talk about pride towards other people. He says this kind of pride is to despise the people and to look down upon them. When someone is amazed by their own self, thinking highly of himself and thinking himself to be better than others, this causes him to have pride towards the creation, to despise them and to mock them and to degrade them through speech and action. And this is what Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about it is enough evil for a person to despise his brother Muslim. And he said, this is why the man asked what about a person who loves wearing beautiful clothes and shoes? Because he feared that this would be a type of pride. The Prophet ﷺ explained to him this was not a type of pride because the, this person was someone who complied with the truth and was humble towards people and that excuses him from both types of pride. So as Sa'di rahimahullah talks about two types of pride. Pride in rejecting the truth which may reach the level of kufr and it may reach near to it and pride towards people which is not wearing beautiful clothes or uh, we, like we're going to talk about being proud of our children's achievements or being proud of our achievements in Islam but it is to have scorn and disdain for the people to look down on the people and to believe that you are at such a high level and these people are so low that is an example of, of kibr we've mentioned many evils of evil effects of uh, pride we've mentioned uh, the statement of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, about rejecting the truth uh, and we mentioned or we're going to mention the hadith uh, regarding the isbal, regarding letting the thobe go below the ankles because this relates very strongly to pride whoever lets his garment drag along the ground out of pride Allah will not look at him on the day of resurrection and Abu Bakr 
radiallahu an, he said, sometimes my garment slips down from side to side unless I pay attention to it. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, you are not doing that out of pride. So now we have to ask ourselves a question when it comes to this lowering of the thobe or the trousers or the jeans or whatever below the ankles. Many people say, I'm not doing this out of pride. And so they excuse themselves from following the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Reflect on everything that you have heard about pride so far. We've talked about what pride is and what pride entails and some examples of pride. What pride is worse than hearing the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and saying this doesn't apply to me, I am above it. You need to reflect upon this because this is from the, the tricks of the shaitan against the people. That he says to the people, you're not making your thawb hang below your ankles out of pride. Your trousers are not hanging below your ankles out of pride. You're a humble Muslim so you're excused from it. Subhanallah, you're not excused from it. This is a statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu He said, whatever is below the ankle is in the hellfire. So we need to reflect upon this. If we really want to be from a people who are not afflicted by the disease of pride, then we need to be very, 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 very careful that we don't fall into these tricks of shaitan whereby we say, I'm not full of pride. There is nothing worse, no pride worse than hearing the statement of Allah and His Messenger and saying, this doesn't apply to me, I have no need of this. And this is a very, very serious form of pride. As for Abu Bakr, he had come to a time, there was a time of, uh, of hardship, a time of famine for the Muslims and he became very thin. And his thobe would go down from side to side, from time to time, and just fall slightly below his ankles and he would raise it up to make sure that it didn't. And the Prophet said, this is not your own fault, this is not your own choice, you're not turning away from the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal, you're not turning away from the sunnah of his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all you are doing is you have come across a certain circumstance and you're trying your best to get through that. And that's very different from the person who says that I am in no need of this sunnah, I am in no need of this command of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We said how Allah Azza wa Jal will humiliate the people, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, who are people of pride. And this is how Allah shows how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can thwart the aims of the people. Somebody plots to, pro to be arrogant and to be so full of pride. Look at Fir'aun and then look at the death of Fir'aun and how Allah made him a sign for the people. And this is what Allah does for the people to the people of pride. It was narrated from Amr ibn Shu'aib, from his father, from his father's grandfather, that the Prophet said, on the day of resurrection, the, the arrogant will be gathered like ants in the form of men. Humiliation will overwhelm them from all sides. They will be driven to a prison in hell with the hottest fire rising over them and they will be given to drink the juice of the inhabitants of hell. And this is a befitting punishment for the sin of pride. Now what I thought it was very important for us to talk about now is the word pride and how sometimes we use the word pride but we don't mean the kind of pride that we've been talking about today. We mean the kind of pride like when we say we are proud of our children or we're proud of our achievements. Now when somebody says I'm proud of my children or I'm proud of my achievements, as far as I can see and Allah knows best, that person is in one of two situations. Either that person is saying that they believe themselves to be above the people because their children have achieved something or they believe themselves to be better than the people because they have achieved something. This is the kind of pride which we have been talking about today. But as for someone who says, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, I'm proud of my children's achievements and they don't see that that makes them holy or high in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal, then this is not the kind of pride that we are talking about today. And this kind of pride is not haram. And the ulama, they have given several fatawa to say that this kind of statement when you say, I am proud of my children, I am proud of myself, this is not the kind of statement that is intended to mean the pride that is mentioned here. This is when you are thankful to Allah Azza wa for what He has given you and you see it, take happiness in achieving something and you take happiness in seeing your children or seeing your brothers and sisters achieve something. This is not the kind of pride that we have been talking about today. In terms of a general cure for diseases of the hearts, in my last part of my talk I want to talk a little bit about how we cure this issue of pride and this problem of pride. I wanted to read to you something that Al-Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah said. Al-Hafid ibn Hajar said, the heart has been singled out for this because it is the leader of the body through the purification of the leader the subjects become purified. Meaning the heart of the body is like the leader of the Muslims. When the heart becomes pure, 
the rest of the body becomes pure. So Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah continues to say, so if you, O servant of Allah, wish to cure your heart, then it is upon you to be truthful with regards to seeking refuge with Allah. First thing Ibn Hajar says, be truthful with regard to seeking refuge with Allah. The first ayah that we read from the Quran, the statement of Musa, that I have sought refuge with Allah from every prideful person. And that encompasses from the, from the person themselves. And then Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar says, to put your trust in him, to pray a de great deal of supplementary prayers, nawafil prayers, to perform actions of obedience to Allah frequently, to pray the night prayer and to treat your heart by making it continuously stick to the remembrance of Allah and befriending the righteous and to frequently recite the Quran and indeed Allah will indeed allow all of this to be preserved by him. SubhanAllah. And Hafidh ibn Hajar gives us some general principles relating to all of the diseases and the sicknesses of the heart. The nawafil prayers, putting your trust in Allah, the night prayer, obedience to Allah, seeking refuge with Allah, remembrance of Allah and befriending the righteous. And one of the most important remedies for overcoming the diseases of the heart is to study and to, and to ponder the texts and the ayat and the ahadith that talk about the warnings and the issues of the diseases of the heart. By reflecting upon the glory and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that Allah Azzawajal describes himself subhanahu wa ta'ala with this term because he subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect in every single way and he is the one who is deserving of pride he is the one who is deserving of being above all of his creation and controlling them and when we reflect upon the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we realize the imperfection of our own selves and this helps us to correct the problem of pride also humbling yourself in the presence of those people who you think yourself to be better than them. You meet someone and you think, you know, Alhamdulillah, I'm better than this brother. And when you feel that disease start to go into your heart, what do you do? You humble yourself before them. You remind yourself that you don't know what you're going to die upon or what they're going to die upon. Like some of the Salaf said, when I meet somebody who is older than me, I think this person has had more chance to do good deeds than me. And when I meet somebody that is younger than me, I think this person has had less chance to do sin than me. So everybody that you look at, you look at yourself as being inferior to all of them. And you don't know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, some people say, well, I got knowledge. They don't have knowledge. But subhanAllah, sometimes knowledge is a trial for a person. Sometimes knowledge is an adab from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you don't act upon it. So what makes you think you're going to be from the people who will act upon it? From the people whose deeds have been accepted? So when we don't rush to judge other people, and we have this problem in our society, we're very quick to judge other people. That we start to see ourselves as being inferior and we treat people justly, and we don't judge other people. You know, you see a brother wearing a certain kind of clothes, or you see somebody in a certain, you know, kind of, with a certain kind of mannerism, and immediately shaitan comes to you, and you look at yourself as being superior. Remind yourself that you don't know what you're going to die upon, and you don't know what they're going to die upon. And they may be from the most beloved of the people to Allah when they die, and you may be from the most hated. So when you remind yourself of that, inshallah, this will help you to overcome pride. And one of the remedies of arrogance is to remind yourself that you're just like everybody else. You're from the children of Adam, and Adam was created from dust. You were created from, uh, as Allah Azza wa Jal describes, a disliked water. You were created from, subhanAllah, something disliked and something which people consider to be unclean. You were created from this. Your father Adam was created from dust. SubhanAllah. What gives you the right to walk on the earth in pride? Remember who you were created, how Allah created you and what you were created from. And remember how you, you know, lived your life as a child, as a baby, with, you know, and you were, you, all the problems you had and all the dependency on other people. And when you remember these kinds of things, this protects you from pride. And when you remember the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, verily the most honorable with you in the sight of Allah is the believer that has taqwa. How many of us can say that we have taqwa? SubhanAllah. Taqwa is something to act upon the obedience of, in obedience to Allah in every single thing that Allah commands you and to avoid disobedience to Allah in every single thing that Allah commands you to avoid. Which of us can say that we've done that? Which of us can say that we have more taqwa or that our deeds have been accepted? None of us have had angels come down and say to us, Ya Akhi, your de deeds have been accepted. So when we remember this, this helps us to overcome pride. 
The arrogant Muslim needs to realize that no matter what he achieves, he is too weak, he is too weak to achieve stature like the mountains and he will never be able to rip the earth apart as Allah Azza wa Jal says. Al-Qurtubi says, commenting on the state of, uh, statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be moderate in your walking and lower your voice. Indeed, the harshest of all voices is the braying of the ass. Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah, he says, do not walk in insolence on the earth is a prohibition of arrogance and enjoining humility. Subhanallah. So even in your walking, even in your outward characteristics, be a person who is humble, who has humility. Don't walk at the front of the people. Don't push yourself to the front all the time. See yourself always as being inferior. Another remedy for arrogance is to remember the punishment, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, for the people who are arrogant. And to remember, subhanAllah, all of the, the weakness of, 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 uh, of Bani Adam, how Allah says that mankind was created Da'ifa. He was created so weak and so powerless and so helpless. And subhanAllah, after that, look at the pride that Bani Adam have. Look at the pride that we have in ourselves, subhanAllah. So this is something that we need to overcome. Inshallah ta'ala, this is basically what I wanted uh, to cover uh, today, inshallah ta'ala. And I wanted to leave a little time, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, before Salat al-Isha for any questions. Uh, we finish by asking Allah Azza wa Jal to teach us that which benefits us and to benefit us in that which he has taught us and to increase me and to increase all of you in knowledge and to make all of our deeds accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to save us from the diseases of the heart, the small and the large, and to purify our hearts and make us from those people who Allah loves and to join us together in Jannah al-Firdaus al-A'la. Mm. Okay, how does it tie in that Allah says uh, in the Quran that Allah doesn't... Uh, hold you to account for unintentional oaths or for mistakes that you make in that regard. I think in this, the key word possibly in this is unintentional. However, there's no doubt amongst, or there's no disagreement amongst the ulama of Ahl Sunnah that the heart has actions that we are called to account for. And it has statements that we have to make. Likewise, the tongue has actions and likewise the limbs have actions. And all of these are a part of our iman and we are judged according to all of them. Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't take you to account for mistakes that you make in general and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't take you to account for things you intend but you don't follow through on. But as for those things in your heart that you do intend, the heart has a massive part to play in the iman of a person and a massive part to play in their reward. Look at all of the deeds of the heart, trusting in Allah, fearing Allah, so many kinds of shirk and so many kinds of uh, of major sins occur in the heart rather than on the limbs like fearing someone as Allah deserves to be feared and like loving someone as Allah deserves to be loved and all of the other uh, actions of the heart that the people talk about and this is from the greatest of things we're called to account for but as for unintentional mistakes that we make in the heart or things we intend but we don't follow through then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't call us to account for this this is what it seems to me and inshallah it's a good idea go back to the ayah Just go back to the ayah inshallah Look at a simple tafsir and try to see whereabouts the ulama talk about it and then see inshallah it's a, it's a good research project to do. It's worthwhile looking into because this is again part of what I said about when we hear the Quran, it's really good. You hear the Quran and you reflect upon it rather than just letting it pass by and saying, oh, well, I don't understand that. You know, inshallah, it's well worth looking into and seeing if we can find any more information than that inshallah. But that's what appears to me. Wallahu alam. That's a good question because even though in general, you know, uh, Doing something deliberately is a condition for many uh, sins to actually occur, that the person actually does it deliberately. But there are some things that are what we call مما يعلم من الدين بالضرورة Things that are known in the religion by every single person, you know. And it's very important that a person doesn't say, well, you know, I didn't know that we didn't have to pray. You know, I didn't know that we didn't have to fast Ramadan. I didn't know that women had to wear the hijab and so on and so forth. That's very important that we don't fall into that because those things are known by everybody. As for those things that are truly confusing for people and they make it, you know, they genuinely don't know, that's what I was referring to. As for mistakes, then all sins are mistakes. This is one of the words for a sin, you know, is a khati'a, you know, is a mistake that you make. And kullu bani adam, kullu bani adam khata. All of the children of Adam make mistakes all the time. And the best of those who make mistakes are those who repent. So mistakes are like sins in the sense that you are. A sin can be a mistake and a mistake can be a sin and you can be called to account for it. 
But what I was talking about more than that is when somebody inadvertently makes a mistake, somebody accidentally does something, they didn't realize it was haram. In those cases, we distinguish between those things which are obviously known by everybody to be haram and those things that are confusing that many people don't know about and they inadvertently fell into it. And in any case, it's obligatory on the person to make tawbah in both instances and to seek repentance from Allah Azza wa in the hope that they didn't fall into something uh, you know, that they uh, weren't aware of and Allah knows best. The first comment you made was very true that the purification of the heart is a process. It's not something you say, oh, well, I've purified my heart now. I've made hajj. I've purified my heart. I'm done now. Alhamdulillah. Move on to something else. Purification of the heart is something you have to do every single day and you have to hold yourself to account for it every single day. Um, as for a means of knowing whether you've achieved it or not, there are two things that are very, very important. The first thing is always presume that you haven't. And this is one of the best ways of purifying the heart is that if you look at how Allah describes the believers, the people of Jannah, He says that we, they were amongst their families living in fear. In fear of what? In fear of their deeds not being accepted as some of the ulama of tafsir mentioned. So constantly fearing that you haven't achieved it, constantly criticizing yourself. Like the statement, the famous statement, حَاسِبُوا عَنْ فُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُحَاسِبُوا Take yourself to account before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you to account. And that's something which is very important. As for a, a litmus test as to whether any of your deeds have been accepted, I only know something that was mentioned by Shaykh Ibn Thaymeen, rahimahullah, and others, when he said that he was asked specifically about hajj, and he was asked about whether somebody, how they could tell whether their hajj had been accepted or not. And he said that Allah Azza wa Jal, the reward he gives of a good deed is to allow you to commit another good deed, to allow you to perform another good deed. And another and another. So if you find yourself in that, in that path of purifying your heart, that you are able to keep on doing it, and you are able every day to keep on asking yourself, and you are getting better and better, and you're seeing the, the correction of the body, like we said, how when you correct the heart, the body will become corrected. And you're seeing your iman increase, and you're seeing your outward deeds increase, and that is a process that's getting better and better, then this is a very good sign that you're on the right track. But at the same time, it's obligatory upon everybody to fear that their deeds have not been accepted. And that's very, very important. It's one of the best ways to purify your heart is to fear that your deeds haven't been accepted. And Allah knows best. There are many types of ignorance, but ignorance is one of the fundamental causes of misguidance. If we look at Surah Al-Fatiha, we see two groups of people. We see those people who had that degree of arrogance and that degree of pride that they turned away from the path of Allah al maghdubi alayhim. And we see those people whose ignorance led them to turn away from the path of Allah, al dalin And so when we see these two groups of people, this is a, you know, some of the ulama, and I think Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentioned that this is, what, this is the root cause of all evil in, in Bani Adam, is ignorance and this aspect of, uh, you know, um, like this, uh, I don't think it's the word used isn't arrogance, but it, it encompasses arrogance, that turning away from the truth and that, uh, you know, those people who knew the truth and they earned uh, Allah's anger. I guess I think Ibn Taymiyyah uses the word dhulm, uh, this uh, like uh, oppression. And I think the, the, but I think here oppression is linked very strongly to um, the aspect of, agri of, of arrogance here. The person is, is oppressive because they are arrogant and there's no doubt that arrogance is described amongst the children of Israel who are the intended people described by al maghdubi alayhim so it seems that the that ignorance and arrogance or ignorance and oppression are the two primary causes of misguidance in bani adam and i believe that if i'm not misquoting him is a statement of ibn taymiyyah rahimahullah okay inshallah then it just remains for me to you know uh, say jazakumullah khairan uh, for listening and uh, I certainly benefited this, uh, from this a great deal. I enjoyed it a great deal. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, there'll be a chance for us to meet again, inshallah. And obviously for those brothers who, are, who head up north, inshallah, to Newcastle, you're always welcome to uh, come and see us over there, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.